Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. What is the time now? Good my, almost afternoon, ladies my, and gentlemen. My watch is still on London time, and it says 10 to 5 in the morning. I would like to present to you our Eric Salame, who knows about the internet, I guess, more than 99.9999% of the people, because he sits on 40,000 feet high, and look on what's going on in, on the internet with how many pairs of eyes. How many people do we have working yeah. for us? Uh, about 30,000 people around the 30, world. 30,000 people around the world who are mining data from the internet. And he has some very, very interesting observation. Eric is the CEO of a company called Kantar. Did I say it right? Or Kantar? Yeah, Kantar. It's a, you know what Kantar stands for? Kantar is the acronym of a... No, it's a... It's a... It's an the horse. Egyptian, it's an Egyptian yeah. unit of measurement for weighing cotton. Ah, really? Okay, very good. Obviously very relevant. And he has a lot of insight that I think will be very interesting. And maybe we should start with the last thing we chatted over there. Who are the current players which impress you the most on the internet and why? Um, well, that's a big question. I mean, I, I think that in terms of the big players and, and, you know, at the moment in terms of the marketing world, there's really a, a duopoly between Google and Facebook in terms of advertising dollars. If you look at all of the growth in terms of internet advertising, they account for 100% of it. So there's a, a dominance there. But I think if you look at, there's lots and lots of startups, and you heard from some of the startups, but in terms of some of the big players, the two that I would really look out for would be Snapchat and Amazon. Snapchat and Amazon. Yeah, I mean, Amazon because um, they are really revolutionizing the world of, of marketing. Um, the number of households who now belong to Amazon Prime um, has grown massively, and that is a very tight community where the rules of marketing have changed completely. What is the size of uh, this uh, group? So if you, if you took um, the number of households in, in Amazon Prime and you, you looked at their purchasing power, they would be the second biggest market in the world after China. Really? So it's, a, it's incredible growth, and, and the relationship that Amazon now has with Amazon Prime members is huge. And if you talk to most, not just um, this week, Amazon, uh, it looks like they're going to become the number one apparel retailer in America, which is, has come from nowhere. And if you look at um, packaged goods, they're disrupt, they account for 10% of packaged goods sales in the US. They disrupt 100% of all companies in terms of packaged goods. So I think, and in search, Amazon is Google's biggest competitor. On search? Of, on search. And so you I are think not it, talking on the old A9, which they no, have no, done. No, no, it's, I mean, so on search, Amazon is probably the biggest threat to Google out there. Um, so I think if you look across the board, and, and I'm not even talking about cloud computing, and you know, they announced yesterday they were reducing the prices on on Amazon Web Services by 20%. They're already the lowest cost provider. They're reducing it by another 20%. So I think if you look across the board, Amazon are probably the most impressive player in, in the marketing space in the West. I mean, obviously, when you look East, you have different models, and you have Alibaba yeah. and Tmall and lo lots of things. And so, but in the West, I would say, Amazon and Snapchat, which I think has, has really developed itself into a genuine competitor to Facebook and will begin to get a lot of advertising dollars from, from yet, a lot of advertisers. Yet Alibaba created a fire hose, which was able to drive, I think, $16 billion in one day. Yeah. That's a huge, robust... Yeah. It's bigger than the entire economy of Portugal in a year they drove in one day. And what is the conclusion of it? What is the promise and what is the threat? Well, I, th I think the, the promise um, 
for a lot of the, the manufacturers in, in China is you, you can't be a manufacturer in China without thinking about kind of omni-channel and thinking about Alibaba as one of the channels to market. It's, um, you, you know, most of our clients now have presences there, but the thing that for most of the manufacturers, they're used to dealing with a Walmart or a Tesco or a, a Carrefour or whoever it may be. This is over. But they're, they're not used to they, they're not used to dealing with discount retailers. They're not used to dealing with Costco. They're not used to dealing with e-commerce. So for the manufacturers who have grown up knowing how to behave in a certain world, all of the growth is now coming through channels which they're not really comfortable with. That's interesting. So you have 30,000 people, and like Alexander Mokadon, the and Greek, the, the, the Alexander Mokadon, who was a commander that allegedly knew the name of all his soldiers. So you know, you know the name of all your 30,000 employees. <laughs> I, I wish, but I've, I've been doing the job for 13 years, so I know a lot of, a lot of people, and I'd spend you know, 60, 70% of my time traveling to, to the market. So, okay, so what, I wish I knew all 30,000. What the hell your company is doing? <laughs> um, so we, we um, help multinational clients, local clients, really understand their consumers, understand people as people. And I think the, you know, one of the biggest changes is advertisers now understand that they need to understand people in the round. That if you want to understand what makes you buy something, I can't just look at your behavior in that category. I need to understand you as a person, because I need to understand the context in which you're behaving and thinking. But, so we do everything from innovation, helping clients introduce new products, what's happening to their brands, and increasingly, we're using that to predict behavior as opposed to explain past behavior, and increasingly so, really working with media agencies, creative agencies, to turn that into actual programs and to so activate tra it. So traditionally you were, or initially you were doing it by mining numbers mainly. Well, historically it was mostly through surveys. Now we understand people by doing facial recognition and understanding their emotions. Can you elaborate on it? This is very interesting. So you are able to read so we, emotions. We, we test more ads around the world than anyone else. So every time that Coke is doing an ad, we will have pre-tested it, or Unilever, we will have pre-tested it, or Yili in China, we will have pre-tested it. Um, and for, for the pre-testing now that we do, we do it on a mobile phone or a tablet we record people's emotions. We record what their faces look like when they're watching the advert. And we know the points in the ad, or if we're showing them a concept or a new car or whatever, we know the points at which they're angry, happy, excited. You can decipher it from the image of the face. Yeah. So there's lots of neuroscience techniques. We do you know, some very simple techniques that if I show you a picture of a brand or a car or whatever it may be, and a word, if your brain thinks that those two things go together, so if I, if I say, um, uh, you know, Singapore, and uh, I show you a map of Singapore, and I show you a word like progressive or um, fun or whatever, if I think those two words go together, my brain can react very quickly. If I see a brand and a word that don't go together, my brain takes a bit more time to react, like a nanosecond or two, but we can measure that nanosecond or two, so I know which two concepts you feel what go you together to. and which two concepts you feel don't go together. How you measure it? So we ask people to react quickly. You know, we show I them see. images on a screen. We ask them to press, press a button. The faster you press that button, the more we know that actually you think those two things go together. So if I show you, you know, a picture of Eric Salama and boring, 
people will react slowly Very quick. because, like, oh who my think, God, of course that's true. Who think Eric Salame <laughs> is boring? Raise your hand. But in a nanosecond, it needs to be, you see? Who think he's very interesting? <laughs> Raise yes, your hand. Yes. And like one person, you see, so it's slow. You have about, it's no like, one is thinking no, that you are boring, yeah. five think you are interesting, yeah. and, nine, and, and 200 or 300 don't listening. understand what no. we are talking no. about. And they're just doing emails. Yeah. Yeah, they came in to do email. It's yeah. very... Well, it's a nice bright set. There's yeah. good light here and there's good Wi-Fi. Good. Let's, let's proceed to another topic, Eric. You drive or you are suggesting to your customers to drive a lot of their decisions by algorithms, right? By pro you call it programmatic. Well, part, what part, is part of WPP on the media side, programmatic is growing very fast. Yeah. Programmatic is going very fast. WPP, we have to mention, is the parent company that your group yep. is one of the biggest uh, divisions, yep. subsidiaries, how you call it? Subsidiaries, yeah, we're, we're part of WPP, so we account for about 20% tw of WPP. Yeah, let's ask question. If he has... 40,000 people, and he is accounting for 20% of the company. Who can calculate how many people are in the company? <laughs> Nobody. I'm telling you, we have a very active... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who is alive? Anybody who is alive, can you raise your hand? <laughs> it's not a majority. What's going on here? It's too hot. Who understands English? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> Something, show us some reaction, you know, we are... You see, this is, this is where, so you're doing a survey, you're asking people those things. What we should have is we should have cameras on people and be able to, to read people's facial... Facial, you cannot... And, and then we can tell whether or not people... What are would you say the, the sentiment of this... I can't, uh, I can't tell, I need the camera and I need, the, I need it to relate to our I, I know, I know, where is Daniel? You know, Daniel gave us this slot that we are between the people and their lunch. Yeah. So their mind now is set on one thing and this is to have, uh, to have lunch. Who is for that we will finish the session right now? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who wants the session to go ahead? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, we begin to have some traction. Yeah. Some tra Thank you for the people who raise your hand. Thank you very much. Uh, algorithms. Yeah. When you have an employee who has to execute something, if he's doing a good job, you can praise him. If he's not doing a, doing a good job, you can train him, you can uh, teach him, you can fire him, you can replace him, you can do a lot of things. When the decisions are being made not by your employees, but by algorithms, how you administrate an algorithm which is not doing a good job? Who is accountable? Who is behind the algorithm? Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, it's a great question and it's... Um... A great question means that it doesn't have readily a, a available <laughs> answer. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, what, one of the things is that uh, I mean, you can obviously relate um, people's media exposure to their behavior. So one of the things that we can do is we can begin to understand, okay, does, does being exposed to this ad lead to a certain type of behavior? But you're right, that along that process, there's lots of stuff that we don't understand if it doesn't happen. I mean, the, the measurement, I think, of digital is very poor. You know, the idea that we count as a view someone who could have watched a digital ad. It doesn't need to be full screen, it can be part screen for three seconds without sound. That counts as a view, is ridiculous. So I think we have, as an industry, genuine problems about viewability and measurement, which the likes of Google and Facebook are having to address now, but it's been there as an issue. Um, and we have, I think, lots of technology that you know, is being pumped out there, and we don't always know the, the outcome. So there's, I think there's a bit of a tension in the world between a desire for efficiency and cost. Like, we can, we can serve up ads faster and more cost-effectively than we used to be able to, but there's a bit of a trade-off going on between efficiency and effectiveness in lots of areas of, of the marketing world. And 
but, but most advertisers are on the path to efficiency. They're not really organizing themselves or behaving in a way that really drives consumer engagement, people engagement, and effectiveness. And these new methods that you are mentioning, like being able to decipher emotions and understanding better the, the tacit, tacit components of making decisions, you think will help the, the industry to reach more to the emotion of the, of the consumer? I think the, we, we can do a lot more than we could ever do before but it doesn't mean that advertisers and their agencies are using all of that stuff. So just because we can do it doesn't mean that it happens. And um, I think we're still in a situation where most advertisers and their agencies are not really making use of all of the insights really? which are available to them. So the, I think the data and insights world is still operating in a bit of a silo compared to a silo which is the activation silo and there's a huge opportunity to bring those things together. By the way, you said a few minutes ago that you employ 40,000 people. 30,000, you increased it ah, to 40,000. I see, because the last time we had this uh, fire chat, you had 27,000. Yeah, so maybe we've grown, but it's definitely not more than 30,000 and it's definitely not 40,000. I see, but, but who counts as you say? <laughs> Let, uh, let go back to your unique observation position that you see it up, uh, up there and with all these 30,000 people you see what's going on in the internet. Tell us a little bit what's going on in China in the internet. Well, I mean, I think you know, one of the things that is happening in China and elsewhere, and, and it was interesting listening to the previous panel because the previous panel said the world's becoming more global, we're all more global. And I think if you look at the world, it's actually becoming more local. Really? Yeah, and I, I think, and it's not just because of Donald Trump, I think. Who I is think Donald Trump, by the way? Anybody <laughs> who knows who is Donald Trump, please raise your hand. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the least it's, responsive yeah, it's, it's audience. Tough, tough audience. Tough audience. Very I tough think audience. what we should do but is collect the debris of our ego yeah, and just leave the stage. Good. But if you look around the world, you, know, you ask about China, the brands that are growing in China are all local brands. Yes. All of the growth is local brands. If For you, the time being, let me add. Well, but I, th I think it's not just China. You go to, I was in Colombia, 75% of all of the growth is coming from local brands. In Brazil, all of the growth is coming from local brands. You go to Nigeria, all of the growth is coming from local brands. You go to India, um, I don't know if you followed it, but um, a guy called Patanjali, a brand called Patanjali, is taking on all of the established global players. So there's a reason why local brands are doing so well, and that then comes onto the internet side of things as well. You know, the model for internet, obviously, in China is very different to the model for the US in everything, e-commerce, social media. But so I, I don't agree that we're becoming more global. I think, I think companies have hit a wall of globalization, and the companies that are really going to be successful going forward are going to be the ones that stop thinking just about cost efficiency and actually start thinking about how to really, really become relevant to local people. Because I'm a consumer. I'm not a global entity. I'm an individual living in a certain place. And my cultural norms, my society, the brands, I'm still local. So would you define that this is the era of disenchantment with global brands? Is it the end of Coca-Cola slash uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken slash uh, Unilever? Or? I, I, I think they can still be successful but they need to become much more local organizations. And, and cost drives global companies to behaving more and more globally. Yeah. And do you see that this very important insight is being internalized by the multinationals? I think some of them have begun to understand that they need not just, you know, you can go to India and you can get 
different flavors of, of products and stuff. So it's not just in kind of flavorings and local taste. It's that they need to give their local companies, they need to become much more empowered to do things fast. Part of the reason why local brands are successful is that they do the things that they need to do much faster. So we, we did a really interesting project for one of our global clients. I won't say which one. And they were worried about innovation. And we said, let's look at this market. And we looked at um, a few markets across Asia. And we said, of all of the innovations where someone else introduced them before you, why did, this, why did a competitor introduce the innovation before you? And in 70% of the cases, our client had the innovation developed internally, but it took too long to get global to sign off for new R&D, for global Very to sign off on something. So they're not stupid people working in global organizations. They just slower. They see the same things, but they're not, they, they just can't move as fast because of the global bureaucracy. So you say local is more nimble. Local is more nimble, and it's more, you know, if, it's more important, if you're only operating in India, or if you're only operating in Singapore, being successful here is life or death. If you're a global company, okay, India goes up a bit or down a bit, but you've got other things that compensate. You need to be, it's life or death for you, and you need to, that's what a startup feels, that's what a local company feels. You have stolen my next question. Can you elaborate in that respect a little bit startups vis-a-vis -vis large companies in the local area or in the ability to innovate quickly into the market? Do you have any observations in that respect? Well, I, th I think, you know, all, all startups that I know, their biggest issue is scale, how yeah. to scale. Um, and all global companies that I know or big companies, their issue is how do we innovate more? So I think there is something there where it works well. Big corporations partner with startups to get the best of both of those things. But you know, you know, you've seen a lot more than me and you're much more experienced. There's so many great ideas with startups that never make it to being a successful company. You know, I, 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 I spoke about it two days ago and I mentioned the famous story of Sir Winston Churchill and Lady Astor, that she came to him and said, Sir Winston, if we make a child, he will be a smart, as you and as beautiful as me. That's a great proposition. He said, yes, but what will happen if it will be the opposite? <laughs> Nobody is laughing. I'm telling you, it's devastating. <laughs> At least, can you applaud a little bit to cheer you? We are working so hard to make you laugh. Let me try another one, you know. I'm really desperate now. Are we on the Winston Church? I went to see... No, no, Winston Churchill. Winston and we Churchill. finished with Winston Churchill? No, 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 we didn't finish with Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill once tell, told Lady Astor, Lady Astor, you are very ugly. And she looked at him and told him, and you are very drunk, Sir Winston. So he thought a little bit and he said, yes, by tomorrow I will be sober. <laughs> We, are, we, we threw with uh, Winston Churchill. No, I went to visit, um, have you ever been to Blenheim Palace where he was born? No. So right, next time you're in, in the UK, I'll take you to Blenheim Palace. It's a palace just outside Oxford where, um, where he was born and, uh, and raised and, and he's buried there. And he's, there's a, a whole exhibition of his life and his uh, family motto and all of those things. It's, yeah. it's a well worth a trip. Would he survive in an era of internet, you think? I think in a lot of ways, you know, if you think about the successful entrepreneurs, I mean, which are the successful companies at the moment? They're companies which are run by kind of benevolent dictators. They don't have shareholders to account for. I mean, whether it's Snapchat or Facebook or Google or News Corp, these are run by people who really run the company based on what they think is right as opposed to the shareholders. So in that respect, I think Winston Churchill would be in a good place. You know, he, he was not a good prime minister in a, in a peacetime. He was an amazing leader during wartime. He had different characteristics. I think he'd be a good leader of an internet company. We have uh, maybe another three or four minutes. Tell me, you've asked me lots of questions. Tell, you know, you've been... It's a few months since I've seen you. 
what's been the most interesting thing that you've seen over the last three months? Let me, let me share with you one thought about China. You know, I'm really fascinated by China, and you say that they are catering to the local market. I have a different theory, and I will try it on you. When I look on China today, it reminds me of the United States in the late 60s, early 70s, when they, the large companies began to feel that they exhausted the local market, you know, this market which was created by the end of World War II and then the Korea and Vietnam Wars, the veterans came home, they needed an apartment, they began to buy cars, televisions, etc., created huge economic prosperity. But then when the growth began to go slow, the companies were addicted to growth and then they began to go abroad all over the world to try to reach new market. And this create mainly the multinational uh, boom. When I look today on, on China, I tell you what I see, and I'm interested to know your view. I see many large companies with great entrepreneurs catering to yet unsaturated local market. You know what is the percentage of, of cars or phones in China, there is a thriving uh, middle class, but it's definitely there is still potential to sell into the local market. So these companies are selling the local market by doing it. They cater to huge market, to the biggest market in the world. They learn how to own their manufacturing practices, their business practices, their marketing practices, their accounting, their raising finance. You know, the, the, the stock market is becoming more and more efficient. But some of them began to go abroad. Huawei, Alibaba, a few other. And when they go abroad, they go abroad in a very different way than we are used to. You know, they go very aggressively. They capture market share, much like, much like Amazon. You know, they yeah. focus about market share before they focus about anything else. And they create very efficient system. Now, you wait another five years, seven years, maybe 10 years, when they feel that they exhausted the local market and their growth will become the growth of the population, not the growth of the yeah. slack market. And then they will turn to the, to other markets. To the outside world. I yeah. think we are going to see something very, very, very substantial because they will come with the ability to sell to hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. So this is my view. Maybe I may agree there's, with you. There's all of these things saying time up and the, no, the ladies, ladies stand there making us Let's like... Let them go away. <laughs> we are now in a trance of talking and we'll continue to talk. Uh, He's the chairman, I can't say anything. Who wants us to finish the session? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who wants us to go ahead? Raise your hand. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Salame. Thank you very much, Yossi Vardy and Eric Salama.